an opportunity that indeed Lord our God we can come before you we can come into your presence and just to hear from your word to hear from you through our servant Lord our God we thank you for your servant uh, Dr. Gide Lord our God we pray that the heavens will open above even as he will be sharing and we pray Lord our God the anointing by the power of your Holy Spirit that indeed you will meet the needs and the expectation of everyone who has joined us in this uh, virtual uh, platform. We commend the meeting into your hands and we are seeking alone and our God that you're going to uphold all the connectivity of every one of us who has logged in. And dear Lord, our God, we are asking that you go ahead of us. And Lord, you will make this night a success, even in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are asking that uh, begin with us and do it for the glory of your name. We appreciate you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Uh, you are all welcome to this guest lecture. And uh, the training program is SORT. Uh, SORT is acronym for Sandolas African Leadership Training. And uh, Sandolas is a, a Greek word. Uh, translated the fellow servant of the same Lord. And this is the basis of our training, which is training on servant leadership. This uh, program is a program of intercessors for Africa. It is based on the various nations of Africa, including uh, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, Ghana, and South Africa. And uh, for the Kenyan chapter, um, it is uh, being run under the Kenya House of Prayer. Um, for my name, for the sake of uh, those who have joined us, my name is Johnson Washira, and I'm the National Coordinator, Kenya House of Prayer. Um, the program is designed uh, to raise and uh, uh, train, equip leaders so that they can be able to take up their role in transforming the leadership in the continent of Africa uh, because of the various gaps that we have noted. And uh, being transformative in nature, I believe today's theme on the effects of uh, transitions on the leadership and the institution, it is actually very key. The program normally ran for 22 weeks. Uh, we began in uh, September. Uh, it is uh, expected or anticipated that uh, um, by February, we will actually be coming to the end of the program. Now, other than the topics and the teachings that go on, and uh, guest lectures normally form part of this training. And uh, when we have that kind of uh, an opportunity, we also will open the program for other people to join us and so that they can benefit from the training. And so as for now, I wish to stop that uh, there concerning the, I mean, the introduction of the training uh, and I want to invite our registrar, Elder Nancy and Dote, uh, so that he can introduce the guest for today. And uh, so that all those who are waiting uh, for the lecture, we can actually be able to start in good time. Maybe towards the end, we can also have some time 
when you can actually raise questions. So again, I want to welcome every one of you and uh, please be on board. Welcome, uh, Sister Nancy. Sister Nancy, you are welcome. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, I think the host had uh, muted me, but thank you so much. Um, as you've heard, my name is uh, Nancy Adote. I'm serving uh, as the registrar for SALT. At this point, I want to just do exactly what I've been told to do. But before that, I would want to welcome everyone once more and say good evening. And I trust that this will be a very uh, wonderful evening that we'll be able to learn at the feet of uh, our bishop. Our topic today is about effects of transitions on leadership and institutions. And uh, the bishop will be talking about some of the things that Christian leaders need to think of as they address matters of integrity, mentorship, accountability, and transparency. So to speak to us this evening is uh, the Bishop Reverend Dr. David Oginde. He's currently the presiding Bishop of Christ is the Answer Ministries, SITAM. I'm sure most of you have heard about SITAM. SITAM is a church ministry that is uh, committed to intentional discipleship through churches, schools, and media. Bishop also serves as uh, the chancellor of Park University, and he is the chairman of the Evangelical Alliance of Kenya. Bishop David Oginde holds a PhD in organizational leadership uh, from Regent University in the United States. He has a Bachelor of Architecture from University of Nairobi. Bishop undertook his biblical studies from the Trinity International University uh, in Illinois, USA. He is a great Bible teacher, a leadership trainer, and is married, and together with his wife, Nancy, they have two children. I have also had the privilege of serving uh, under the leadership of Bishop at the Elders Council. And so together, let's welcome Bishop David Oginde. You're welcome. So Bishop, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. You can see me? Yes, we can. Yes, you can. And you can hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Thank you, my elder. It's great to see you uh, on this virtual platform. And uh, thank you for the rest of the leadership and for giving me opportunity this evening to just share a few thoughts on the topic that we have been given. Uh, interesting because I'm going through transition myself. In just a few days, I will be no longer presiding bishop of our uh, ministry. We are in that process of transition. So it's, it's something that is very current uh, for me. And uh, what I'll share are some thoughts and lessons that have just recently uh, gathered as I walk this journey of leading transition in our ministry. Um, so I'm going to use a Jesus model of leading transition. And so, what I'll be sharing will be drawn primarily from Jesus' way 
uh, in which he uh, led transition. And we'll pick a few factors that I, I think are very critical for any leader to consider when they are leading a transition process. And I pray that this will be helpful to all of us as we uh, share together this evening. One of the realities of transitions is that they can be tough, they can be messy, and can even be fatal to the organization. Uh, there are many great organizations that have died in the process of transition. In air travel, it is said that the most dangerous sections of the flight are at takeoff and at landing. Most air crashes uh, happen in these two sectors of the flight. It is very rare that an aircraft would crash while at cruise level. Very, very rare indeed. Uh, in the history of flying, there are very, very few aircrafts that have crashed at uh, cruise level. There must be something that just went wrong. But most crashes is either a takeoff or at landing. In the same way, in organizations, the most critical moments of leadership are the transitions. Many great organizations have been totally destroyed at transition points, uh, either because of leadership wrangles, uh, poor handover, or just lack of a successor, and the organization that was growing very well suddenly be, uh, either crashes or begins to go down. That is why, though it is said that there is no success without a successor, for me, I say you have not succeeded until you are succeeded. This is because to be succeeded requires more than a successor. It includes the full gamut of the transition process. And so if a leader is to be considered successful, they have to be successfully succeeded. Now, while there's many models for management, managing transitions, and I'm sure some of us are familiar with them, I want to draw the examples that I'm going to use today from the life of Jesus Christ and how he managed the transition process from himself to his disciples that carried on the work to today. So if the church is to be considered as an organization, this is perhaps one of the oldest organizations that have successfully continued for over 2000 years. That is unusual that Jesus set put in place an organization, uh, started it and for just three years was able to transfer leadership to a new team of leaders. And as this has carried on year after year, year after year to where we are today and is still going strong. What are those factors that could we could borrow from Jesus' model of managing transition that could be helpful to us as leaders, even in our time today. There are so many, actually, when I was uh, studying this, I found that there are just so many. It was just for exciting for me. I hope it will also be useful for you. But because we have a very brief time, I have picked only a few that I will want to share with us uh, today. The first one, is the perspective of leadership. The first factor that I see important for leading uh, a transition within an organization is the perspective of leadership. The view that a leader holds about leadership will determine how they lead and what happens at the transition point. 
because uh, the view that we hold of leadership and many of us view leadership differently. If I was, one of the things I do when I'm, I'm doing leadership training is to ask people to define the word leadership. And it's amazing how different people define this word differently. A very common word, but not easy to define. But the way you define it and the way you understand it will determine how you practice it. Or at least it will determine how you receive leadership. And this will influence how you plan and manage succession and transition. It calls for high personal understanding of who you are and how therefore you can be able to guide a process. Some scholars have studied this whole process and uh, Gothard and Austin, who have done a recent study on transitions, uh, say that the personal cl clarity about what leadership is will determine how a leader departs or transits from their leadership position. And this is related to the timing and the role that the leader plays uh, within a succession or transition process. When we look at the life of Jesus and how he transited and managed the succession process, we find that one of the things that undergirded his work and his leadership was the knowledge of who he was or who he is. The Bible tells us in John chapter 13, verse number three, John chapter 13, verse number three, the Bible says, Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. I want to underline three phrases there. One, the father had put all things under his power. That uh, word put is critical. The second one I would underline is come from God. Jesus knew that he had come from God. And the third one is that Jesus knew that he was returning to God. Why are these three uh, phrases important, especially in the context of what we are discussing today? It implies that Jesus knew that he was a man on an assignment. This was not his final destination. This was not his final abode. This was not where he was going to spend eternity. He had simply come to accomplish a task that had been put on his shoulders by God the Father. So he knew that he had come from God. He knew that he was going back to God. So if I put it in ordinary language, I would say he knew where he had come from, he knew where he was going, and he knew what he had come to do. That is very important for every leader. A leader must know where they have come from, a leader must know where they are going, but also more importantly, a leader must know what they are here for. Many times, leadership transitions fail because people do not know those three things. They don't know why they are where they are. I simply know that I'm the Bishop of Sitam and it's a prestigious position for in the other, some people's eyes, I would say even in my own eyes. And so that is all that I enjoy. I do not remember where I came from and how I got into this position of leadership. Worst of all, I do not even consider where I'm going when my assignment is over. And so many leaders do not consider those three things. And that is why when it comes to transition time, it is a crisis. It's a crisis because my life and my work were all intertwined with my position. And so I have been the Bishop of Sitam 
Now, what else am I going to be after this? I cannot see how I'm going to fit in society, how I'm going to live my life when I am no longer Bishop of Sita. How am I going to do, be, what am I going to be when I'm no longer the CEO of this organization? What am, not going, am I going to be when I'm no longer the president of this country? And these are things that leaders struggle with simply because they did not think through them. And so we find, particularly in Africa, leaders who do not want to leave office, leaders who even when their term comes to an end, they will look for ways to extend that term because they don't know where they came from and they don't know where they are going and they don't know why they were here. So Jesus models for us that he knew that the Father had put all things in his power. He knew he had come from God and he knew that he was returning to God. That helped him to do certain things that if you read that text of scripture, ordinary leaders would not do. For one to lead a successful transition, they must first know that their duty that they perform and the position that they hold is an assignment that has been bestowed upon them and which will eventually come to an end. They must therefore know when that time has come to an end so that they can successfully lead the transition process and hand over this work to another person. In John chapter 13, verse one, actually the Bible records that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He knew my time is up and nothing therefore could hold him back because he knew I was a man on a assignment and my a time for my assignment is over. I have to leave. Three short years and Jesus had completed his assignment. I have been Bishop of Sitam for 10 years and I just feel like I have just started. Sometimes I feel like if I was given another opportunity, there's so much more that I could do. But I knew from the beginning that this was an assignment that had a fixed time period, two terms of five years each. And therefore, as I conduct my leadership, I should keep that in mind and give me a proper preparation for the leadership transition. Therefore, I would say that a proper perspective to leadership is critical for leading a smooth and successful transition. Those of us who drive, you may know that when you are an amateur driver just starting off, you hold the steering as if it is your dear life. And uh, my instructor used to tell me, you don't have to hold it so hard, just hold it. But I felt like if I don't hold it hard, the car would go off. <coughs> but with maturity and experience in driving, you can even, you, this is not uh, allowable, but you can actually hold the steering with your fingers. It's, it's, it's uh, because you know how to control the vehicle. So you don't have to hold it as if it is going to fly off. And when I see leaders who hang on to leadership, it tells me that that person is not yet mature in their leadership. The second factor that I see in managing and leading transition is the planning for succession. That is a whole subject by itself that could take us a whole day. Whereas in many organizations, the board is responsible for succession planning and transition management, the exiting leader is equally responsible for helping the organization to prepare for succession by planning adequate time, updating the organizational documents, managing the transition process, and managing external and internal relationship, and actually making sure that the whole process is dealt with in a manner that brings out a smooth transition process. 
the implication for this, in my view, is that planning for succession and planning for transition should actually start the day a leader assumes office. The moment you are given the responsibility of leadership, that very day, you should start working on how to get yourself out of the job. The vision and mission and the core values of the organization must be reviewed and refined. The systems and structures should be strengthened to carry the organization into the future. Your core team must be built and equipped to implement the new agenda into the future. We see this in Christ. When Jesus came on earth, his agenda was to establish the kingdom of God. And from the beginning, his focus was on the message of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 tells us that from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And what was he preaching? Repent for the kingdom of God is near. So you find that this message of the kingdom, if you read Jesus' teachings, I know we pick here and there, but the whole of Jesus' preaching and Jesus' teaching and Jesus' life was about the kingdom of God. He taught about the message of the kingdom. He taught about the ways of the kingdom. He talks about the values of the kingdom. He talked about the, how the kingdom operates. And this is what he did in whole entire time of his leadership on earth. He put together a team of 12 to work with him and to be with him as he developed this kingdom agenda. And from there on, everything he did was focused on establishing the vision, the mission, the values of the kingdom. And he worked with this team. And you can see now when you look back, because we have the, 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 the advantage of seeing the beginning to the ending, you can see that what he was doing with these people was to prepare them to carry on with the work of the kingdom. And so we can say that from the very beginning of Jesus' leadership, the thing that he was doing is he had already seen the end of his time here on earth. So whatever he did was headed towards that succession planning, that uh, transition program, and he put everything in place so that within three years, his duties, his responsibility as a leader were done and dusted. Many transitions fail because by the time a leader is exiting office, people are not clear on where the organization is going. Because we have been very busy, we have been doing many things, but if you were to ask any member of the organization, what is this organization about? What do you normally do? Many times you get murmurings, you get uh, mumbling, and you get, you, nobody is very clear on what they do. They may pick one thing here and there, but you may find that whatever they are picking may not be the actual vision and mission of the organization. And so a leader must make sure that this is so clear in the minds of the people that all the members of the organization, all the team leaders, are very clear on what we are about, what we do and why we do it. So that should the leader step out of the scene, the rest of the members of the organization can continue leading this organization forward. Should the leader step on the side, anybody else can step into the scene because the systems, the structures, are in place. That's another area that many organizations fail because you have not put in place systems and structures that would undergird the moving forward of this organization. And there is no team to carry on the vision forward. One of the sad things about Joshua 
in the Bible. We all know Joshua was a great leader. Having learned after, under Moses, he did an excellent job in uh, leading the armies of Israel to conquer Canaan's land, finally settling the people of Israel in uh, their, the promised land. By the time he was finished with his work, we find him in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua, where he calls the people together and he asks them that powerful questions, question, choose this day which God you will serve. But he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I have always taken that as a powerful confession. But as I look at it from a leadership perspective, it was a tragic, com uh, a tragic comment. Because it's like Joshua is saying, for me, I will follow the Lord and my house. For you, you are free to do whatever you want. And indeed, by the time he left, the Bible says, once he and his generation passed on, Israel did whatever anyone wanted to do. Why? Because they did not know their God or what God had done for Israel. What a tragedy that in just that short period, the people of Israel did not know God, did not even know what God had done for Israel. Think of an organization from an organizational perspective that just after the first generation of leaders that a leader leaves in place when that team of workers and staff leave the scene, the new coming team, the people who are on board have absolutely no idea where this organization came from, where it is going and for what purpose. I do not want to um, use specific examples, but I can tell you several Christian organizations that I know about that have totally lost the original vision. I think of an organization like YMCA that was started as a great ministry to reach out to young men, great impact. But later on, when you heard about YMCA, you thought about sports, you thought about recreation. Uh, they had totally lost the original vision. I know that some of the YMCAs have since tried to regain their original vision. But what a loss, what a loss of vision. So transitions fail because by the time the leader leaves the office, the vision is lost. The third factor I would like to share with us is what I call the pronouncement. What is the pronouncement? Transitions generate a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of mixed emotions. Therefore, one of the most critical factors in leading a transition is communication. The pronouncements about the imminent transition. When done well, this helps to allay fears and to normalize the process. Various stakeholders within the organization need to be appraised of the process at different stages. Whereas initiating such conversations can be awkward for the leader, yet it is the task of the leader to manage appropriate communication and pronouncements at the right time. Such pronouncements should target the team members and other key stakeholders. The lesson I learned from Jesus is that because he knew that his time was coming to an end, and because he knew that he was not going to be here forever, you'll find it at different points in his interaction with his disciples and at different points with his, in, in his interaction with the general public, he gave hints that he's not here forever. For example, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 and 18 and 19 to 19 rather, this is what the Bible records. Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, we are going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death 
and he will, re will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus warns his disciples that we are going to Jerusalem, but this could be, mark the end of my life. This could mark the end of my time with you as your leader. And he said this several times, mentioning it to them several times. And this helped to prepare the disciples so that by the time the departure came, at least they knew that this was coming. The question sometimes is asked is, how early should such pronouncements be made? Of course, there are several factors that should guide the timing and the nature of the pronouncement. For example, the stature and the success of the leader or the size and complexity of the organization. A highly successful and a highly regarded leader must start making pronouncements quite early. Because when a leader is very successful and a leader is highly regarded, people never think about their going away. It could be an organization where people know that uh, this is the retirement age of, uh, uh, of leaders, or this is the term period that is given to a particular leader. But because everything is going so well, the assumption is that our leader will always be with us. And so it is important the leader begins to make these pronouncements to help people begin to realize that he is not there forever. Some of these pronouncements can be made informally uh, very early on, but as time draws near, they can be made more formal. Likewise, in a large and complex organization, the pronouncement of transition should be announced early. I normally say that whereas a house help can give you a few minutes notice, you know, you wake up in the morning and they tell you, uh, today I'm gone. Uh, by the time they are telling you that their bag is already packed and you have no otherwise but to let them go. A CEO of a large organization cannot do that. You cannot just rise up and leave. You need to give at least one year to three years notice that I will be going. So that people begin to prepare themselves this is a mark of integrity. This is a mark of doing things with excellence and openness and accountability one to another. You do not just rise and say, by the way, you know, I have only one more month to go or two more months to go. What then do people do? How do we get a successor? How do we manage the transition? You put the organization into a crisis. So these pronouncements are very critical and you begin to make them early. As I told you, uh, my uh, time as a, a SITAM leader is coming to an end in a matter of two weeks. But I started making this pronouncement more than two years ago, just to help people to know that uh, I'm going. Sometimes I used to make it as a joke, uh, just humor and here and there, but it was to begin to prepare the minds of people. Then as time drew nearer, I, I, I made them more serious. And as time drew nearer, we began the process of a replacement and so on. By the time I'm leaving now, people have even got used to my going, which sometimes is a painful experience. And I'll talk about that later. But it makes the transition easier and smoother. It doesn't put the organization into a crisis. The fourth factor I want to mention is the politics of succession. This is absolutely critical for managing transition. Let me say that no matter what kind of organization one leads, transitions will always evoke political maneuvers. The leader must know how to manage these politics, otherwise they can totally derail the process. Jesus had at least three political situations that he had to handle in his transition process. There was the political canvassing by James and John. After Jesus announced that he was going to Jerusalem, 
somehow in James and John's mind, they thought that this is the time he is going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And so they approached Jesus and said, Master, we would want to ask something of you. This is recorded for us in Mark chapter 35 to 39. And they asked Jesus, they want one to sit on the right and the other one to sit on the left. Now, in the kingdom principle of the time, those who are positions of authority and of power. And so James and John, hearing that this is going to happen, they wanted to occupy those positions before somebody else come in, comes in. And so they came in and made this request of Jesus. Interestingly, soon after, their mother also came and added her voice to that request and asked Jesus to allow his sons, one to sit on the right and the other one to sit on the left. Now, how did Jesus handle this uh, situation? Because it was very politically dangerous because the Bible tells us that when the other disciples heard about it, they were indignant. The, the NIV uses the word indignant. Indignant is beyond anger. They were absolutely furious because they wondered, we have been walking here together. Kumbe, you people have been planning and jama, you know, something behind the scenes. So they were absolutely angry. And this had the potential of dividing Jesus' team. Jesus dealt with that in a very wise way. He told these people, you don't know what you're asking. In this kingdom that I'm building, for you to be great, you must be a servant. And for you to be great, you must make sacrifices. And so he said, can you make the sacrifice that I am going to make or I'm making? He said, can you drink the cup? This is what you do if you want positions of leadership. And so he diffused that whole thing, which would otherwise have divided his team. Then there was the demand by the crowd in Jerusalem to crown him king of the Jews. You remember when there was a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, everybody came out and they put their clothes and palm leaves and they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna. What in their minds was, was that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to set up the kingdom of the Jews and to throw out the Roman empire. And they were so happy as they sang Hosanna. The Bible says Jesus did not commit himself to them. Many times a leader will find himself in a situation where, especially if you are very successful, people do not want you to leave. People do not want you to go. And therefore they sing these hosannas and they want to get you into another place uh, that was not yours. Uh, I can say in, on, in, uh, on a light note, some of my, my people have come to me and said, Bishop, you're so young, where are you going? Maybe you should create a position of archbishop so that you can become our archbishop. Now, those kinds of things may sound like a joke or a humor, but I, I know that they have happened in organizations where people create a new job uh, uh, or a new position for themselves so that they do not leave. Jesus did not commit the, himself to that. The third situation uh, of, of political maneuvers that I find very interesting is after the resurrection, Jesus comes and has breakfast with his disciples in John chapter 20 and 21. And there he asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Jesus, uh, Peter says, yes, I love you. And he commissions, basically commissions uh, Peter to be the leader of the church and of the flock. After that, you know that Peter had betrayed Jesus and he was very, very uh, un uh, rather uncomfortable about it. But the fact that Jesus now comes and now gives him this responsibility, he just felt like, wow, the past is forgotten. Now I am ready to lead again. Jesus has restored me. And they take a walk together. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, verse 20 to 23, the Bible says that Peter, as these people were walking together, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? 
Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. And I'm picturing this uh, scenario where Peter feels like this is my moment. I am with the king. I am with the master. He has just restored me. He has given me leadership. And then he sees John also following. And it's like this John man, whenever we are sitting with Jesus, he leans on his bosom. He sits very close to him. This guy could possibly take my position. And so he asked Jesus, where is this guy going? Where is this man going? And Jesus again diffuses that situation and asks him, what is it to you? Why are you bothered? What if I wanted him to remain alive until I return? And the Bible tells us that rumor began to spread that Jesus had said, John is not going to die, which was not true. What I gain here is that it would be naive of any leader to assume that there will be no politics during transition. It may be mild, but it is there. It could be vicious as has been in some organization, it is there. As a leader, you must know how to handle political situations, how to diffuse tensions, how to manage the ambitious and all those kinds of people so that you can manage the transition successfully. The other factor is the picking of a successor. How do you pick a successor? According to Gothard and Austin, there are five ways of identifying a successor. One is called the relay succession, which involves identifying a member of the senior management in an organization and working with them well in advance to eventually take over the place of leadership. The second one is called non-relay inside succession. This occurs when an insider is promoted to be the leader of the organization, but had not been identified previously, but is selected through a competitive process involving several key candidates within the organization. The third one is external succession where a successor is taken or hired from outside the organization and brought within. The third, they call it the coup d'etat. This occurs when the stakeholders within the organization consider that the incumbent is not delivering according to expectation. And so whereas they may have a particular term, let's say five years, two years, six years, whatever period of time that they have been given to lead, the leadership or the stakeholders find that we cannot allow this person to continue. They are not taking us where we need to go. They are going to lead this organization into collapse. And so they have to change leadership. And so the incumbent is forced to leave and a new person is brought in. That's why it is called the coup d'etat. The last number five is called the boomerang. Boomerang is when the stakeholders look at the organization and they look within, and there's no person who in their view can take the organization to the next level. They look outside and they can't see a person who can bring and uh, take over the organization and move it to the next level. And so they go back to a former leader and bring him on board. You saw that happen recently with Safaricom when Michael Joseph was brought to step in and lead the organization for some period of time. And so the boomerang is bringing in a former leader so that they can lead the organization. Each of these, if we had time, we could explore the pros and cons and the circumstances under which each can be used and how that can help an organization to move forward. But when we go to Jesus, we, I see Jesus using the non-relay inside succession. But he also uses the external succession or the coup d'etat. It is clear that Jesus, if you read the, his journey with his disciples, did not groom a leader 
over the period of time that he was walking with them. There was no clear person that you could say, this is the person that Jesus from the beginning or at some point identified that this is the one I'm going to walk with and work with, say like Joshua and Moses uh, or Paul and Timothy. But it appears that when the time for him to appoint a leader came, he brought his whole team together and conducted a brief interview to pick one of them from among them. And this I found very interesting as I was reading the scriptures with this perspective. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, the Bible says, but what, what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What I see here is that Jesus brings the 12 disciples, and he puts this question to them, who do people say that I am? And when they had all answered and each person said what they had heard, finally he asked them, and who do you say that I am? And I imagine that there was a silence because the Bible doesn't say that they gave chorus answers like they had given to the first question. And in a moment of silence, Peter steps out and says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus then says, because you have answered that question, in verse number 19, Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But more than that, he says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The question that we would ask ourselves is, what if it was John who had given that answer? What if it was James who had given that answer? What if it was somebody else had given that answer? Would they have received a similar kind of commendation from Christ? I believe so. In my view, this was an interview conducted among the 12, and Peter passed the interview and was appointed the successor for Jesus' work. And Jesus gave him uh, the responsibility to lead the church there on. But when Peter started his leadership, after Jesus left, there are challenges that began to appear. Peter had great difficulties with Gentiles. He would interact with Gentiles uh, when he was alone, but when there were other Jews, he would remove himself from the Gentiles. So Jesus comes to him in a dream and lowers a sheet with various kinds of animals and asks him, rise up and eat. And Peter sees this as a uh, uh, and clean animals. And Pete, Jesus tells him, no, don't call what is, un, uh, what is I've made clean and clean. In other words, these Gentile people are part of my kingdom. And he sends him to the house of Cornelius. And, and Peter, Jesus tries to get Peter to embrace this kingdom agenda of universal uh, entry to every person. But Peter just could not get it. And so in chapter 13 of the book of Acts, the disciples are praying and 
Saul of Tarsus has been converted and is part of the fellowship. And the Jesus comes and says, set apart for me, Paul and Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've set for them. And once that was done, from there on, you find that Paul becomes the de facto leader of the church. Paul is the one used of God to establish the kingdom of God across the world. He is the one who finally takes the gospel into Rome and to other parts of Asia. What happened to Peter? Peter is confined in Jerusalem. And I see this as a coup d'etat or an external recruitment to replace, in a sense, Peter. May not sound good, but I leave it to you to consider. Finally, the last two points I want to make is the, the pain of succession and transition. One of the things you will realize as a leader is it doesn't matter how well you do. When it comes to success, uh, transition, it can be messy, it can be difficult, it can be painful. And again, I see this in the life of Jesus. The first pain that I see Jesus facing is what I call the pain of reality. You can be have served for a very long time, knowing that your time is coming to an end, you manage the transition so well, but when finally that time comes, the reality hits. I'm no longer going to be bishop. I'm no longer going to be CEO. I'm no longer going to be the president. Where is my life going? What is going to happen to me? That is the pain of reality. And let me allow me to use this example. Jesus came knowing he was going to die for the sin of the world. But when the time come for that reality, we find him in the garden of Gethsemane. And he's pleading with God and praying. And the Bible says he sweat, prayed the sweat uh, until the sweat of blood came out. And he's saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. The reality of the pain of the cross, the pain of carrying people's sin upon him just became heavy. And I can say there are many leaders when they come to the reality of their time up, they are crying, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. They want to continue. They want the perks. They want the benefits. They want all these things. And no wonder many leaders don't want to give up. Many leaders, I've known some leaders who have handed over, but during the transition process, they come back and they take over, especially in church settings. The second pain is the pain of false accusations. Jesus is taken to this court of judgment in the night and people have been brought to bring accusations against him. And they brought false accusations against him. And it was a painful experience. And he's beaten up for things he did not do. And I've seen many people, leaders, in times of transition, struggling with false accusations and people bringing up all manner of things that, oh, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did the other. And while he was a leader, this happened. And they did this and they did the other. And sometimes it can be a painful experience when it is a false accusation. One of our pastors, senior pastors, did an excellent job. But when his time was up, those days we didn't have bishops, so I would say one of our bishops, when his time was up and he was just about to leave, this national accusation came upon him. And it was such a painful experience for him because he had tried to live his life in the best way of integrity as possible, above board and everything. And yet at this transition point, these false accusations were brought upon him. His name was flushed in the newspapers and he left this country a very, very devastated man. 
the Bible says that Jesus answered not. When false accusations come against you as a leader in transition point, sometimes the best is to answer not. The other pain that came, can come is pain of public humiliation. Jesus is lifted up on the cross and people are saying, oh, this man was so great. Why can't he now remove himself from the cross? People, some people are spitting on him and beating him up and so on. Public humiliation. The same crowd that had loved him and sang Hosanna were now throwing all manner of insults at him. What was Jesus' response? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The last pain was the pain of desertion. All Jesus' disciples left him. But at some point when the pain was too much on the cross, he even felt as if his own father had left him. Cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And sometimes in transitions, you can find yourself in that place where you wonder, is God still with me? Why has God left me? Why are all these things happening? God is right there. And finally, Jesus says, it is finished. He let it go. Sometimes you have to let go. The final factor is the parting. How do you live? How do you exit the scene as a leader? In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, and in Matthew chapter 28, we see Jesus exiting the scene. The first is to envision your people. Jesus calls his disciples and he says, all power and authority is given unto me. Now go into the whole world and preach the gospel. Make disciples, baptizing them. And then he says, lo, I am with you until the end of the age. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he empowers them. He calls them and he says, go into Jerusalem and wait. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And after the Spirit has come upon you, you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other part of the world. And while they are looking at him, the Bible says he's taken up into the heavens and it disappears into the clouds. What do I see there? That a leader must know when to exit the scene. But before you exit the scene, you must envision your people. You must ensure that people are envisioned, the vision for the organization is clear to them. But finally, you must be taken in the clouds and disappear from the scene so that your successors can move on. This is what I learned from Jesus, several factors on how to manage and transition. God bless you, amen.